Welcome back again from the break. I hope you had something really refreshing so that you are ready for the next presentation. The title is Heliotherapy in Ancient Greece and Today. So the first question I want to raise is why Greece and not Egypt? Because we thought or some of us think that the heliotherapy um, has been fun founded uh, in Egypt about four or five thousand years ago. Mm, we do not have robust scientific data that this really is the case. What we know is that um, in Egypt we had a kind of sun worshipping um, that we had um, sunlight uh, treatment or uh, using the sunlight for um, hygienical purposes and that the Egypts were praying to the sun as the highest god but not all the time during all the periods in ancient Egypt. Um, here we see Amenhotep the fourth or Eknaton, Eshnaton, um, he was the one who tried to establish a monotheism um, with the sun, with Aten, this is part of this name, Aton or Aten, with the sun disk as the highest power and as the highest god. And therefore we find this um, life-giving force of light symbolized by Aten, by this sun disk in many many pictures um, and statues and uh, reliefs. We see another example for the sun disk and um, especially the light medicine people would interpret um, pictures like these as um, the medical or therapeutical use of um, the sunlight. Again, Aten, here we see um, Eknaton as a sphinx. And on the next slide, we see a little detail. It's the Ankh cross over here. And this is why, this is a sign, a symbol for life, this Ankh cross. I, I'm not sure, is it right in, in English? Yes. Ankh? Yes. And this Ankh cross symbolizes life, and therefore um, it is more or less logical that people would interpret this as a um, sign for the therapeutic use of sunlight. But it is only guesswork what we definitely know uh, by the way, this, uh, do you know the names or at least one name of these three children we are seeing here on this picture, on this slide? Agnaton and Nofretete and three children. One of, of the children of this couple is uh, quite famous. Do you know? Yeah. What we know uh, about the use of light in Egyptian medicine is, for example, from Herodot. He was traveling um, in the Mediterranean area many, many years and uh, made his observations and um, wrote them down. And we know from Herodot that um, the Egypts used light, sunlight, um, for the conservation of food, that they used it for disinfection. And from the Battle of Pelusium, where the Persians were fighting against the Egyptians, he visited the places where they stored the bones and skulls, and they separated the skulls from the Egyptians and from the Persians. And um, Herodot noticed that with a little um, stone, you could break a Persian skull, but you could not break um, the skulls of the Egyptian um, warriors even with big stones because they had much, much, much bigger or stronger bones. 
and he was the first uh, suggesting that the use of sunlight was the reason for the strengthening of, of the bone structure because the Egyptians they um, removed their hair from the head and they went out into the sun and um, treated or just um, got their, the sunlight onto their skin in opposite to the Persians. They wore big heads and they wrapped themselves into black or other tight clothing. So the sunlight uh, didn't have the chance to come in contact with their skin. So they had rickets and they had thin bones and Herodot was the first, about 500 before Christ, um, who got the idea that there is a connection between bones and sun. In the 1920s, um, Kurt Hulczynski, a German um, physician, found out that this was true. How did he find it out? He had children to treat and these children suffered from rickets and he did um, photographs, radiologic photographs, x-ray photographs from both um, arms, but he treated only one arm with uh, ultraviolet producing sun lamp. And he could tell after a while that the bones became stronger in the other arm too. So he suspected there must be a substance distributed by some body liquid, probably blood or lymph or whatever, a substance preventing rickets from treatment of one hand working in the whole body. Hulczynski, I think 1927. But back to the ancient times, we have more robust data from this famous Egyptian uh, physician. <coughs> His name was Imhotep. And um, he mentioned that uh, in some medication recipes, uh, the sun was um, mentioned in terms of uh, chronobiology chronobiology more than 4,000 years ago. The Egyptians already knew when to take a medication after sunrise or whenever the time was right. You find traces of this um, chronobiological thinking in Imhotep's material and data. Also, um, they used the sunlight for desiccation of medical preparations to dry something they put together in terms of um, preparing a potion for healing. They also, um, he also mentioned uh, the photochemical activation of medical preparations. So if you brought substances together you would have to put them out into the sun to activate them, otherwise they wouldn't work like they should. And they also knew that they had to protect several medication uh, preparations from the sunlight because they would uh, decompose under the influence of sun. So photochemical um, ideas can be found in ancient Egypt. And we also have um, hints that they already knew about the photodynamic therapy. You know photodynamic therapy was uh, invented by Tappeiner end of the 19th century. He found out that if you take a certain substance it sensitizes the tissue for even long wave light like infrared light and the skin would react exactly the same as it would if you put it into ultraviolet light. Photosensitation, photochemical therapy, you know it from today. If someone has actinic keratosis, you are using some, some cream to sensitize the skin and then it's enough to shine red light on it <coughs> and it would mm, induce a kind of inflammatory reaction. After this inflammatory reaction, normally this actinic keratosis, the damaged cells, are um, yeah, um, abolished or 
removed. So this is what we know from the Egyptian light medicine. No robust data that they really did the sunlight therapy, but for sure they had benefits from being out in the sun. Now let's come to the heliotherapy where we definitely know that Greek um, physicians used sunlight not only for uh, preventive or um, um, hygienic uh, purposes but also for therapy. And the most important uh, physician was Hippocrates uh, on the island of Kos. And his, uh, his school influenced the heliotherapeutic approach um, up to the uh, medieval uh, days. Um, so um, Celsus, for example, up to Paracelsus, they referred back to the knowledge of Hippocrates and his school. What they knew is that sunlight shifts water, sunlight shifts body liquids. And in these ancient days, they thought that a lot of disorders and um, diseases come from a misshift of uh, body liquids. And to correct this uh, maldistribution of body liquids, they were using sunlight in a therapeutic way. And they, are, they were using the warmth of the sunlight and the heat. But they did not know about these uh, compositions, uh, how, the, how the sunlight is composed of. We know today we have infrared rays, we have visible rays, we have the ultraviolet rays, and each of these radiation groups <coughs> um, are linked with a different um, mechanism of, of influencing our cells and body in total, but they didn't know about that. They had, to, they had this empirical approach. Here we see um, as, the Asclep Asclepeion on this island, of course, and Asclepeion, um, it was the, the place where they worshipped Asclepius. It was um, a Greek god. And do you know, uh, have you heard of Asclepius? Yes, so they found here in this Asclepion galleries for sunbathing um, and Asclepios is, as I already said, a Greek god. He is the son of Apollon and Apollon is the god of light. And Asclepius is the god of medicine and healing. And mm, it's remarkable that, that the god of medicine and healing is the, son, is the son of the god of light. So we find in Greek mythology a deep link between light, sunlight, and uh, medicine. So here you find a short list uh, of um, indications for heliotherapy in these ancient days. Shifting of body liquids, cauterization, that means burning of tumors uh, using quartz crystal lenses, by the way. So also the ultraviolet part of the spectrum could pass through the lens. Uh, we find this again um, I think 2,500 years later, when we look at Finson's work, because he also used these rock crystal or quartz crystal lenses. Metabolic disorders, obesity, strengthening the bones, preventing rickets, these were um, indications for heliotherapy in ancient times. And for example, they also had some ideas. Uh, if the sun was too strong, they used olive oil on the skin. 
in terms of um, reducing the intensity um, of the radiation to the body. Do you have an idea of the, of the uh, sun protection factor of olive oil? No, not zero. Another idea? It's only, it's only two. You can stay two times longer in the sun. Um, and the reason, do we have any filter mechanisms in olive oil? What do you think? Yeah, but um, the, the reason, this, the scientific reason for using olive oil is the same reason why the body starts sweating. If the skin is covered with a, um, a, she, she, a layer of liquid, you find a kind of reflection. And the olive oil reflects half of the radiation back from the body. And this is a very clever way of um, reducing the strength of radiation because we do not change the transmission spectrum of this uh, of the sunlight and changing the transmission spectrum um, I'm not I do not know if you are aware what happened in the European Union last year in terms of regulating the, um, the filtering properties of sunscreens. All the natural sunscreens do not get the CE sign anymore because they do not filter the sunlight in the way the European Union thinks it should be. And this leads to the point, to the fact that we can uh, only purchase, um, for example, these titan dioxide um, sun tan lotions which reduce all um, the radiation parts uh, in, a, in the same way. We only can buy this kind of stuff in Switzerland at the moment, but in the future it will probably disappear from the market. Uh, but I don't want to go too deep into this particular issue uh, before I'm not through with my other stuff I want to present to you today. Um, okay. And another thing, what they already knew is always in, in case of strong sunlight radiation, always protect your head. Because the head is transparent, we know that the pineal gland and all the other um, delicate um, steering and regulating mechanisms in the midbrain are quite sensitive to light. And if you do not protect your head, it could ha happen that uh, the regulation uh, properties of your um, system get lost. So always wear a hat when you are in the sunlight, even and especially when you do heliotherapy. And you find it in, in uh, the 20th century in the construction plans for uh, heliotherapeutic uh, clinics. Um, you find always uh, a mechanism which prevents um, the head from being hit by the sunlight. Now let's skip about 2,500 years. Um, what happened in between, um, we have the dark medieval age where light did not play such an important role and uh, religious uh, reasons led to um, covering the body completely from the sun f for certain times. We had Herschel, William Herschel, who discovered a certain part of the spectrum. Who knows which part it was? William Herschel was experimenting with astronomical instruments and trying to find out the, the heat content of radiation and suddenly he, he was uh, projecting a kind of uh, rainbow 
through his optical instrument on a plate and put a thermometer uh, into the different colors and measured the, um, the thermal activity of the colors and suddenly he disappeared um, that in the dark beneath the red the thermometer heats up much more and this was the moment when he discovered the infrared radiation. Another question but it's easier because you have the first answer already. <laughs> oh okay okay who was the one who discovered ultraviolet? Ultraviolet rays. Pardon? No, Downs and Blunt, what did they do? Who said it? <laughs> Downs and Blunt, I think they were working uh, in the 18th of the 19th century and um, they discovered that the ultraviolet radiation is responsible for the killing of bacteria but they did not discover ultraviolet. Pardon? His name was Ritter. Ritter discovered, I think, in 1801, ultraviolet radiation. So we wanted to skip this, so we do. But uh, it will help us when we look at this chart, at this slide. I have to help you in this field. Uh, you only have 100,000 receptors for blue and especially in the macula lutea you have none of them so it's quite hard to read something which is written in a blue field. Here is written actinotherapy and it's performed with ultraviolet light. We have the chromotherapy which is per performed with specific parts of the visible spectrum and we have the thermotherapy which you would perform with the infrared radiation. And the next slide gives us, gives us a little bit more detailed information. Uh, from the actinic therapy or actinotherapy, we can expect <coughs> photochemical reactions. What is that? If you put something colorful out in the sun, it will fade out, the pigment will disappear. And this is a photochemical reaction. That means the ultraviolet content of sunlight destroys these mm, receptive molecules so that they would lose, for example, their filtering and absorption uh, abilities. Um, we find a hyperemia which is delayed. Hyperemia, what does this mean if you go out in the sun? What happens after a while? Sunburn. Sunburn. How long will it take until you realize that you get a sun, got a sunburn from the moment from the moment of exposition to the first sign of hyperemia coming from ultraviolet. How long does it take? No. Couple of hours. Couple of hours, yeah. It takes from two to four hours and this is the reason why we cannot rely on our feeling when we are dealing with the sun. We have to think forward. Not only our brain has to think forward, our anatomy and our physiology has learned during the course of evolution to think forward. This is the purpose of uh, chronobiology when we ask the question, why do we have these mechanisms installed in us, in our system? We find hormone production coming from the ultraviolet. <coughs> <coughs> what kind of hormone? Oh, the opposite could be true. You meant vitamin D. We have hormone destruction. What hormones uh, are destructed in the ultraviolet light? the production of melatonin is suppressed but not from ultraviolet light, it's from the light you would see which comes together uh, with the sunlight. But all, most, most of the steroid hormones for example are destructed and even the sun hormone itself 
becomes destructed in sunlight after a certain while. So if you go out in the sun for more than 20 minutes, the excessive or the, the additional sun hormone which, is, uh, which precursor is produced in the skin becomes destroyed from the ultraviolet. So there's a self-regulating mechanism which um, tells you it makes no sense to be in the sun for, uh, in therapeutic uh, thinking, in the sun for more than 20 minutes because um, everything else would just lead into destruction of the hormones which have been built up, up to that moment. And what we also find for ultraviolet is the DNA damage. So DNA gets damaged from this highly energy loading photons um, as we find them in the ultraviolet uh, part of the spectrum. So the DNA damage, another tricky question for you, what is more dangerous, ultraviolet A or ultraviolet B? Just to give you an idea, ultraviolet A would be the long wave ultraviolet radiation between 310 and 400 nanometers or 380 and ultraviolet B is the part 290 to 310. What is more dangerous to our system? UVA or UVB? UVA. Who said B? Okay. I think UVA. UVB is, has higher energy but it doesn't, come, doesn't get through. It does not penetrate so deep as the ultraviolet A is able to. And um, especially if you have only ultraviolet A and not ultraviolet B, this is especially dangerous because um, what happens when we are out in, after we had been out in the sun and we um, experienced a slight uh, sunburn or a reddishness, not a sunburn, but a slight reddishness of the skin. What happens afterwards? This is an over, overdose of ultraviolet uh, from the head, more or less. So um, I'm talking about the skin at the moment. This, pardon? Edema, yeah, and the, and what follows the edema? Inflammation. What follows the inflammation? Um, you, you find a thickening of mostly all skin layers. Uh, we would call it, hmm, I was thinking about calling it horny skin, but then I thought, ah, oh, Carl will think about something completely different when I talk about <laughs> horny. So, <laughs> so the light callus would be uh, a better description. Um, that means if, if we stress our tissue, it will build up. And if we stress our skin in the right dosage, it also will build up. And um, the light callus will lead to um, a protection of the deeper layers containing DNA, a protection from the ultraviolet rays. But this light callus only um, happens when you have enough ultraviolet B. Because this edema, uh, the histamine production, for, for example, the swelling of the capillaries, only occur in the same range of radiation as the production of um, vitamin D occurs. And this is 290 to 310 nanometers. In this range, in this ultraviolet B range, we have the most clear benefit from sunlight radiation. And now let's think about what the European Union um, tries to regulate. They say each sunscreen lotion has to filter out ultraviolet B three times stronger than ultraviolet A. 
Hmm. Do you think this is clever? No, no I, I don't think so either. I think this is really a dangerous thing because you, the only way to detect that you had an overdose of sunlight is um, the edema, is the swelling. So the best would be not to filter the sunlight selectively because this is a unique composition of radiation and our body is uh, attuned to this unique radiation uh, distribution since millions of years. And when we start to pick out a certain part of the spectrum, in medical terms it becomes dangerous. Not immediately probably, but after a while. So if you hear today that sunlight uh, produces cancer, this is only true, for example, in combination with sunlight uh, screens, with sunscreen filters. If you use sunscreen filters, the UVB is filtered out, but the also dangerous component of ultraviolet A penetrates even deeper into the skin and it's the, the sunscreen prevents your skin from building up this light callus. That means the, the skin remains thin and this is not the summer mode. Thin skin is the winter mode. We have a kind of tides in our skin. It swells in summer and it diminishes in winter. So it pulls out the body liquid into the skin in summer and it refills our body container in the winter when the thin, when the capillary layers become thinner and thinner. Okay? We come to that. But what we know from Finsen is that it's not <coughs> the melanin alone. The most effective ultraviolet filter is the hemoglobin. <coughs> so the blood, the layer, the capillary layer, this is the, the most uh, important and the most effective protection layer in our skin. The melanin has more to do with thermoregulation because melanin, it's a black photon antenna. It starts vibrating when it's hit. And so uh, the sweating will be increased, for example. So look at the people living in the desert. They would have to, to bring out, to, to get rid of the heat. So they have dark skin. People who are living in uh, Tibet, for example, it's cold outside. The thermal stuff is not their problem, but they also have a lot of ultraviolet radiation. They have thicker skin and the skin is yellow. Yellow, just the opposite, is the blue filtering. So the yellowishness of the skin is also a very good ultraviolet filter. Okay. Let's get back to chromotherapy. We have mainly resonance effects, but also quite selective electro, uh, photoelectrical effects um, occurring on membranes. We have mitochondrial activation from the wavelengths of uh, 580 nanometers or even 550 nanometers up to the long wave radiation in the near infrared and infrared. We have these membrane photo uh, electrical membrane effects. We have, we find hormone regulation through the eye, the influence of uh, the light which comes into the eye and goes through the retinohypothalamical tract into the midbrain. These are hormone regulation effects uh, mediated by the eye. And we find oxidative cell stress. This would be which part of the visible spectrum can induce um, oxidative cell stress? Ever heard of the blue light hazard? Yeah. yeah. So um, 
it's the short wave part up to 500 nanometers <coughs> which would lead into uh, increase of um, oxygen of oxygen radical production in the cells so this is uh, crucial for uh, if we want to maintain or take care of our eyes ask Reinhardt, uh, I don't see him, ah, here he is. He has uh, some of his pro computer protection glasses which you also can use as hormone protection glasses in order to uh, uh, control which kind of light uh, hits your retina and which kind of hormonal or endocrine reaction you can expect from that. Thermotherapy we find resonance and circulatory effects. We have an, an instant erythema. So if we go out in the sun and the sun radiation is hot and we get this erythema instantly, this is the first step, step of protecting our tissue from uh, the ultraviolet rays of the sunlight. We have a water molecule activation. We can tell from these dents in this spectral distribution curve. Um, we have a kind of excessive filtering coming from the atmospheric layers um, in, uh, around our planet and the water molecules, they uh, transform the photonic energy into a rotation energy in these particular frequency ranges or um, wavelength ranges. We have hormone reconstruction. The infrared um, is moving the molecules, <coughs> increasing the molecule dynamics. And so molecules which have fallen apart have a higher uh, chance to meet again in the right connection way. And so we have a kind of reconstruction of molecules which have been destroyed by the shortwave radiation. So a kind of compensatory effect, not only in terms of vision, when we think about spectral opponency, we have to go much, much deeper and also think about the molecular effects in our cells, in our system. And we have cell repair, for example, Janice Eels was one of uh, the presenters I could um, listen to at one of the syntonics meetings. She is working with um, wound healing, with uh, restoring the retinal functions after laser hazard, for example, using this part of the spectrum, the long wave part of the spectrum, mainly the so-called near infrared radiation spectrum, which goes from about 700 nanometers to 14 or 1500 nanometers, so the near infrared radiation range is mm, defined. And um, when we are wondering, looking at the following slides, why sunlight is such a potent uh, healing me means of healing, then we have to think about these different properties from the different spectral ranges. And um, then we understand better why we have such a precious uh, radiation um, compound in natural sunlight. Here we come to Niels Rüberg Finsen, the only um, physician who received uh, a Nobel Prize for medicine and physiology. He studied in the late uh, 19th century medicine at the University of Copenhagen. Um, and in, 19, in 1893, he started um, the treatment of pox with red light. And this often is quoted as a proof of color therapy. But uh, be careful if you use this argument because color therapy is um, using a particular part of the visible spectrum uh, in order to activate something or to go into resonance with something. What Finzen did 
um, using the red light. He wanted to cut off the short wavelengths because he found out that the ultraviolet part of the radiation would lead un into an inflammation of these POC uh, emanations in the skin. So they would uh, be become infected most of the time and people would die from this uh, infection of the skin and not from the POCs themselves. So leaving some parts of the spectrum uh, behind um, only using another part of the spectrum which is not as ag aggressive as the uh, first part, this is negative phototherapy and is, it has nothing to do with chromotherapy in the typical sense. Uh, in 1896 uh, he founded uh, the Finsen Institute in Copenhagen. In 1903 he received the Nobel Prize as I already told you and one year later he passed away suffering since many, many years, uh, shortly after he started <coughs> studying uh, medicine. Um, he suffered from a pick syndrome, which would lead into um, edema in the belly. And he, some, he, several years, he lived just with one mm, little portion of water for the whole day because he found out, out if he would drink uh, like a normal human does his belly would swell and swell and swell and so he had to, uh, re had to um, have this water removed by a catheter. He developed a special catheter one day when uh, a piece disappeared in his stomach uh, during this procedure and so just to let you know that this was a man um, who dedicated his whole life uh, to the exploration of um, the medical properties uh, and options of light. Um, he was so sick himself, norm another uh, human would just have said, oh, I'm so sick, I cannot do anything, but he just did what he could do and uh, tried to survive, but it did not last long after his um, Nobel Prize nomination in 1903. So he treated um, the lupus vulgaris um, using the actinic therapy and he received the Nobel Prize not only for having developed the neg negative phototherapy, but also having developed the actinic therapy which meant he um, induced a controlled inflammation in the skin, in the skin of people who suffered from lupus vulgaris. This was the skin manifestation of tuberculosis. And he learned from experimenting with himself and with his wife um, how to um, remove, for example, the blood from the tissue because he was sure that if he would remove the blood uh, the ultraviolet radiation would penetrate much much deeper and experimenting like that so he's shown light through the earlobe of his uh, wife to see what happens and then he compressed the earlobe with two glasses of plates of glass and yeah he was the first um, doing, in a way, scientific experiments with light in order to find out the <coughs> therapeutic properties of the photonic therapy. Lupus vulgaris looked like that, uh, like you would have been bitten by a wolf. Lupus is the wolf in Latin language. And the only way they had before for treatment before Finsen was uh, surgical um, or radiological um, treatment, but you would never have seen such a perfect um, healing as you can see it from this to that picture. This was only Finsen who was able to perform, perform this kind of therapy in that quality. 
after Finsen, um, there were a lot of um, physicians using sunlight. Um, Finsen started to shift in his therapeutic um, way from sunlight to electrical light because in Copenhagen um, or in Denmark they had only 20 to 30 days over the year to use the sunlight for these therapeutic purposes. So he started to use um, carbon arc uh, lamps and later in Germany um, these ultraviolet um, sun lamps have been used um, also for the treatment of lupus vulgaris and tuberculosis. But August Rollier, um, a Swiss physician, he used the sunlight in the Swiss mountains, not only in terms of treating people, also in terms of preventive and hygienic and uh, yeah, use of the, of the sunlight. Here you see a little patient of Rollier with, I think, more than 30 manifestations of uh, tuberculosis on the whole body. Lymph nodes were affected, and you can tell it from here. And normally, this little boy would have died a few weeks later, but he was lucky, came into the Swiss mountains, and was, had been treated by mm, Rollier. After 18 months, you can see him in this condition. And um, in that condition. And this little guy stayed with uh, Rollier in the mountains, so he had an overview also 15 and 23 years later. <coughs> he mm, could tell that this boy had been cured from tuberculosis. And tuberculosis is mainly a problem of the immune system, as many things are. And here we find a diagram of the basic vegetative regulation according to um, Hof. He was a German physician and it's quite astonishing what he already knew in 1934 uh, about the um, regulation system, the endocrine and hormonal regulation system. The only thing I put in is the eye the retinohypothalamical tract and the um, suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is not from Ferdinand Hoff, but all the rest is from him. So in, in days when they did not, when other physicians didn't think about the pineal gland, he already knew that the pineal gland um, acts in a repressing way on the uh, gonads, for example. And he understood uh, the pineal gland and the pituitary gland as uh, the antagonistic actors of a higher principle which is located in the midbrain and which is controlled by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And still today in medicine, even uh, in the mm, latest research, they do not respect this antagonism between pituitary and pineal gland. And um, it's quite essential to make sure that um, if you take apart one pole of an antagonistic system, the whole thing cannot be understood anymore. An antagonistic system listens to a certain set of rules which are different from non-antagonistic systems. This is quite important. I want to point that out. And sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, they are antagonistic ones. And we go into the hormones for this antagonistic regulation. But just a step aside. On one hand, we have more sunlight, less cancer. These are constant findings in epidemiology. An American physician epidemiologist, Frank Appley, found this out in the 40s. We have less breast cancer. You know this chart. 
and just when we are stepping apart for a while, this is what Jacob wanted to show you. This is the pathways of light reception. And do you know where you can get this chart from? Who knows? Please be... Who does not know? Okay, wrong question. Who does not know? You can go to the ELA website, um, internationallightassociation.eu. It's the free media content where you can download this. I asked Jacob two years ago if he would give his allowance to put it on this website. And thank you again very, very much for sharing this detailed knowledge with us. Here you find this uh, regulation system in another way of displaying it. It comes from a publication um, of Walter Stumpf, The Endocrinology of Sunlight and Darkness, Complementary Roles of Vitamin D and Pineal Hormones. And I found this quite often quoted, but I was looking for a long, long time for, for the original text. Uh, I have it mean, in the meantime on my computer and uh, those of you who have a USB stick with you can have, I would share it with you, the original text um, because it gives you a much deeper insight in this antagonistic system. And one of the major tasks of this antagonistic system is to um, regulate our um, vegetative system in a way that we can cope with day and night, that we can cope with the seasons, with summer and winter, spring and autumn. And uh, the more important um, part seems to me the activating branch. It's covered by the pituitary gland, producing adrenaline, no adrenaline, and so on and so on. And we only have one counterbalance, and this is the melatonin produced by the pineal gland. But most of the um, researchers focus on this part, but Stumpf uh, was one of the first uh, insisting in the importance of both aspects of this antagonistic system. And um, here we have a chart um, showing us more clearly what we can find in terms of chronobiologic. We need an increase of stress hormones when we start our day and we need a decrease of stress hormones when the day is over, when we want to regenerate. And the regeneration hormone is the melatonin, which is only produced if we have uh, low levels of light during the evening and during the night. Chronobiologic means that all these organs you can, you can see here are controlled by pineal gland and pituitary gland. We have, from the midbrain, nervous, nervous impulses and these have to be coordinated with the hormonal or endocrine signals coming from these two major actors of our hormone system. The balance between these two poles is promoted by the periodic change, the periodic change. We find also a rhythm between light and darkness. And again, it's an antagonistic system. And why do I show a lizard here? Most of the hormones we are talking about in terms of light regulation, we not only find in humans, we find them also in bacteria, we find them in fungi, we find them in um, reptiles. And the reptile is probably, for that reason, a much better example to understand the light reactions than the mouse is. Why? 
The mouse is a mammal, that's for sure. But when does the mouse live? During the night. And we live during the day. <clears throat> and the reptiles also live during the day. So their internal switching and circuitry concerning these regulation hormones, for example, melatonin, stress hormones, sun hormone, are more or less identical with these creatures compared to mouse and other mammals living during the night. You can tell them from having big eyes. Um, when I listened to uh, Jacob's um, presentation, I thought, hmm, I should show you a picture of synchrony. These are two turtles and um, Don, you know this one? This is Apollon. It's the baby, yeah. But uh, in the meantime, it w when we found it, it was like that. And now it's like that. <laughs> But we have two, two other babies, uh, which came uh, about six weeks ago. And um, again, thermoregulation for those, it's quite important to be out in the sun. And uh, something really uh, interesting happened. I wanted to give them, because they are babies, we cannot keep them outside. Uh, they have 15 grams when they come out of their egg. And 2,500 grams is the weight of the mother. She's, by the way, in my age. But I'm not the father um, <coughs> of Apollon. I wanted to remove the uh, alternative current uh, halogen light from their terrarium and installed uh, a kind of cold incandescent lamp driven with a transformer for direct current so that there was no uh, light modulation. And what happened? They were upset. They went into the light but felt immediately there's some heat lacking. They went away and tried to dig themselves into the ground. A more detailed and clear reaction could seldom find and therefore it's for me it's a quite interesting thing to investigate the behavior of these reptiles which have a 200 million year old program facing the light controlling the amount of light coming into their body and by, as I already told you they have the same hormones in order to mm, control this the same hormones than uh, we have Heliotherapy today, we do not have to heat up in the sun to walk around and become quicker and swifter like the um, reptiles have to. So we are more free, but we have to pay for this freedom. Um, and in modern society, it means that 70% of the people living in modern societies and even more are vitamin D deficient. And as you might know that vitamin D is just a, a wrong expression for a steroid hormone. Uh, you should better say it's soltriol or sun hormone. It's definitely a steroid hormone comparable to cortisol, for example, to the mineral corticoids, to the glucocorticoids. It's a very important and essential hormone produced by sunlight in our skin. And this is the reason, one of the most important reasons why we should go out in the sun, take off our clothes, at least most of them, and protect our heads and get some of this sunlight into our skin. This slide shows the seasonal change of sensitivity for an erythema, and I mean the delayed erythema coming from the ultraviolet. You can see 
we are more, more um, sensitive to ultraviolet radiation in spring and during the summer the sensitivity decreases. So the timing again is very important. Here we see the sun adaptation schedule according to Rollier. This was your question before, Jennifer. Five minutes, next day five minutes more, next day five minutes more, and you would use a blanket just to protect the rest of the body and start with your ankles and feet. And then you, next day you can, uh, your lower limb, yes, so you treat yeah, you pull, pull it up and up and so you can train your skin to cope with the sun radiation without using any sunscreen and the, mm, the result is after three weeks you have built up a intrinsic sunscreen in the range of 40 to 50. So we do not really need any sunscreen if we stay there where we normally live and if we use the sunlight in the proper manner. Adaptation to sunlight only works step by step. You cannot force nature in terms of increasing these uh, adaptation or, or um, yeah, changing these, the speed of this adaptation process. No, 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 for the summer, for the time where you, in, in, in summer we have in our <coughs> areas where we live um, 16 hours of sun, in winter we only have 8 hours or even less. And so this range has to be covered and in winter we have to pick, soak up the sun to say it with Cheryl Crow, and in summer we have to protect partly from the sun. Um, and our body takes care of, of this uh, intelligent regulation. So the, the tanning shades and the skin becomes thinner after several weeks. But we do not need a thick and tanned skin if there is no sun outside. So this is the real purpose for that cosmetic aspects. The intention is short exposition time for maximal vitamin D production. If we treat large skin areas and protect our head, we have the most efficient uh, building up of this sun hormone. This is clear if you only use hands and face skin of the hands and the face, it's less effective than going out in the sun with the whole body. High noon is the best time, even if medical doctors would tell you something different. High noon is the best time for taking a sun bath. Why? Shorter wavelengths are filtered out on longer ways. So if the sun is not standing up in the sky, we have longer passing waves, ways through the atmosphere and so the ultraviolet B radiation is filtered out. But this is what we want from sunlight. We want ultraviolet B. So the shortest distance to pass through for the sunlight is at high noon. It means daylight serving time you have to respect that uh, and correct it to go out in the sun for high noon when the shadows are shortest. No sunscreens, a factor, no chemical sunscreens especially, a factor of 20 diminishes uh, the vitamin D production by 99.9% and 20 minutes of full body exposition equals the intake of 10,000 to 20,000 international units of vitamin D. So one minute full body sun tonation at noon time gives you more vitamin D concentration than one pill. 
So it's better to use the skin instead of these um, pharmacological products. Denise, there is a question. Um, the heat regulation center, for example, is located more or less in your head. This is the steering and controlling central. And like you would be uh, glad if the fan in your computer cools the um, processor, we have to take care that our processor also stays uh, in, in a cool position. And I had a, I don't I cannot show it to you here, but I have a quite sensitive uh, measuring instrument which um, indicates the light shining through the skull. You can put it in your forehead and go into the sun and this uh, system reacts. So we only have five centimeters to get into the center of our brain and for radiation and especially infrared radiation it's no problem at all and this would interfere with the protection and regulation uh, mechanisms happening there. Alexander, how does that compare to what you said before about the Egyptians and the thickness of their skull? Is it possible that, the, that more exposure actually creates a thickening of, of the bone as it would also a thickening of the skin to become a protective mechanism as well as This could be. I have. I didn't find any um, publication on that, but um, I think a kind of overreaction is in an adaptive system also always possible. Therefore, I think the Egyptians did not stay out in the sun the whole day um, because their uh, sun consum sunlight consumption somehow was embedded in rituals and when to start with the prayer and you will start with your meditation tomorrow at 7.45 on the beach together with Wilma and Doris. This was also a kind of hint for me to not forget to announce that uh, we shifted it a quarter of an hour. Mm. So 7.45 you can practice sun meditation and heliotherapy on the beach. The only thing is it's more effective to have another 20 minutes when you are um, entrained to, to catch up the sun, otherwise you should start with five minutes when we have our Mediterranean break. Not really, because um, the trick is to install or reinstall the rhythm. And the normal rhythm for us is that we build up enough vitamin D. I can show you here. You all have heard from cholesterol and all the steroid hormones are constructed from cholesterol and the 7-dehydrocholesterol is changed into pre-vitamin D3 by ultraviolet B light. Then this pre-vitamin D um, is transformed into vitamin D um, in the liver and this is the storage form of vitamin D. So the, I think mm, it remains uh, at least two, three months. It 
degrades step by step, but you have significant amounts even after three months. If you had enough in summer, if, you, if, you're, uh, if your body is filled up with vitamin D3, then you have enough for the winter. Um, our, our body produces the 1 colon 25OH, the active version of, of this uh, calcitriol, of this vitamin D, in the kidneys as it is needed. And it's also destroyed in a very short time. And here you see the regulation zones if you are too long in the sun, ultraviolet B is able to destroy this substance. It builds it up, but it destroys it in a more significant way. Same destruction to suprasterol and so on. So this is the self-regulating process I was talking about earlier. I would not recommend to um, substitute vitamin D um, using the, uh, ra the artificial radiation because we are unable to mimic um, or to reproduce the sunlight itself from this particular specific composition. So probably if you think you are vitamin D deficient, you should go to your doctor, should have a blood test, and once you are sure that you are deficient, take it over the winter and in the next summer do a kind of re-establishing of the natural rhythm, re-establish the chronobiological things in your system by scheduling your day in a way that you can go out in the sun once it's there. Um, probably this gives you part of an answer. Um, the benefit of optimal vitamin D supply um, is, ah, let me, probably uh, you can get back to this question when I have explained this, uh, sure. this slide. Vitamin D deficiency means less than 20 nanograms per milliliter Severe deficiency less than 10 nanograms per milliliter. 80% of my patients have deficiency or severe deficiency. The optimal concentration would be 30 to, to 60 nanograms per milliliter. The recommended daily intake was 5 to 12.5 microgram. It, had been, it has been corrected nowadays to 25 to 50 microgram. Some say you should have 5,000 international units intake every day in order to prevent deficiency. 12.5 microgram is equivalent to 500 international units. And again, one minute gives you 1,000 units, 20 minutes give you up to 20,000. All these types of body tissue have been diagnosed of carrying vitamin D or sun hormone receptors. Small intestine, large intestine, kidneys, bones, thyroid gland, parathyroid, skin, epidermis, basal cell layer, fibroblasts, endothelial cell layer, melanocytes, skeletal muscles, heart muscle, smooth muscles, pituitary, ovaries, testes, breast, uterus, prostate, placenta, thymus, pancreas, circulating activated lymphocytes, monocytes, macrophages. So this is a long list and each single type of body tissue which has been examined has these receptors and they are quite important. They are located in the center of the cell. They control what comes in and out from the inner part where the DNA for example is located at. 
vitamin D deficiency is a risk factor and you can find studies and studies and studies on that for high blood pressure, cardiovascular diseases, breast cancer, colon cancer, osteopenia, osteoporosis, infectious diseases like tuberculosis, rickets, multiple sclerosis, morbus Crohn, diabetes mellitus type 1, systemic lupus erythematodus, higher mortality in general. And I would say deficiency of vitamin D also increases the speed of aging. Yeah? So do you think that part of, of your question is answered by that? Then I have the chance to flip to the next chart. What do you think? What is this? This is the solar spectrum. 50 lines for just covering the visible part of the solar spectrum. And these little black lines are the Fraunhofer linien, Fraunhofer lines. So when I was talking about the specific composition of sunlight, I not only think about the envelope shape of the spectral dis uh, distribution, I also think about all these information lines. It's like a barcode. And in terms of thinking about the photoelectrical effect, this can be in our capillary layers, for example, the information how to distribute the minerals and ions, which, which may come out and which must stay inside. Because we have a light pressure and we have a light suction effect on the membranes. We do not have this photochemical effect which has been explained by Einstein. It was the reason for his Nobel Prize nomination. We don't have this photoelectrical effect only on metal surfaces. We also have it on biological membranes, controlling which particle may pass and which has to stay and remain in inside the cells. So this was my last picture for today, except that one. I hope there are no questions. <laughs>